Good morning, this is Bishop John with another homily from Fire Doc for the second Sunday of Easter, uh, that is Divine Mercy Sunday. The lessons for today are all about the very early days of the church expectant, the Plebs Sancta Dei in the very first decades. Not everything was perfect, of course, but the giddy affections and disregard for material things they show us remind me of my days long before I was ordained as a, a royista in the Curcios held out near the, what it was then the Devore Cutoff here in Southern California. The three-day retreats have been mountaintop spiritual experiences for thousands over the decades. The exaltation and joy of many of the candidates were overwhelming for me every time I served. And I was there many times, including once when our dear Bishop Dwayne Hauser was one of the candidates. His reaction was to begin serving immediately as a priest in the Curcios for a number of years. He also later was a prime mover in establishing the Methodist equivalent in California, that is the walk to Emmaus. The six verses from the Acts of the Apostles, verses 42 through 47, Describe just such an ideal community, committed to the love of God, to prayer, to helping each other, and to proclaiming the kingdom of God. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the, and to the communal life, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's needs. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exultation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The verses paint a gloriously rich experience this was a community committed to worship. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. To be so happy, fearless, and loving in those times would have been mind-blowing to the people around them. The wonders and signs done through the apostles converted, converted many and taught them, brought them into the new community of believers in Jerusalem probably patterned after the Essenes, they had all things in common and provided for one another according to each one's needs. They met daily in the temple area and ate their meals with exultation and sincerity of heart, it says. Their love for each other and for those who came to join them was overwhelming and very attractive. No wonder the followers of the way added so many in such, such a short period of time it says in verse 7. Our faith should be reflected in a constant awareness of our Abba's presence in the world around us, and we should pray always, reflecting the practice of our Master and the Christians we see in the lesson today. There is more, however. We have to walk the talk, don't we? The verses from Psalm 118 uh, 1 through 4, the verse 1 is the responsorial verse, and then there's 2 through 4, and then 13 through 15, and 22 through 24. They all celebrate the work of our Abba and how he saves his people. Verse 1, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel say his mercy endures forever, in verse 2. Let the house of Aaron say his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his mercy endures forever. Verse 13, I was hard pressed and falling, but the Lord came to my help. The Lord, my strength and might has become my savior. The joyful shout of deliverance is heard in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand works valiantly. In verse 22, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. It is wonderful in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. God's love for us is over everlasting and his mercy endures forever, as it says in the first four verses. 
In the old sense of fear, faithful reverence, and affection, let us acknowledge who we are and join our voices with those who have sung the words of verse 4 for millennia. Let those who fear the Lord say, His mercy endures forever. It is because of His mercy that He saves us, that He protects us when we get ourselves into trouble, and not because we have earned it. If we are honest, the only sensible reaction to our deliverance should be one of relief and profound joy. To be rescued, to be safe in the tents of the righteous, despite the extent to which we were hard-pressed and falling, is a remarkable blessing we certainly, I say again, didn't earn. How often we are so weak and only God's strength and might can redeem us and save us because his right hand works valiantly. It is also true that more than a thousand years before our Lord's coming, King David wrote about God's intervention in the world through the Messiah. Thousands of years after the, the Master walked the earth, we still sing, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. The true humility inherent in the point of view of David is therefore a necessary ingredient of our lives as followers of the way, as well as a deep commitment to changing our ways and teaching those around us the truth of God's love for us and of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We should also remember here, his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension unleashed the healing power of the Holy Spirit on the whole world at Pentecost. When we see that God has been our help and our strength and we understand he is our Savior, we finally stepped into the tents of the righteous. And those around us ought to hear our joyful shout of deliverance. It is this kind of exuberance that can infect the world around us and begin drawing our brethren to Christ. As you might imagine, ongoing demonstrations in our behavior of our faith in Jesus Christ are what seal the deal. If God's grace hasn't changed my life, why should anyone else listen to me? I can just barely resist the temptation to cry out, but you should have seen me before. But it's not an excuse, now is it? The Apostle in the first epistle of Peter, verses 3 through 9 today, exhorts the faithful to stay focused on God's merciful gifts of new life. Blessed is be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, who by the power of God are safeguarded through faith to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. In this you rejoice, although now for a little while you may have to suffer through various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that is perishable, even though tested by fire, may prove to be for praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, yet believe in him, you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. They've been given a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Despite their suffering, things won't stay as they are. Through their faith that is more precious than gold, they will be protected by God and saved for the salvation that will be theirs in the final time. They do not see the Master, yet they love him and believe in him. They rejoice with an indescribable and, indescribable and glorious joy as they reflect on the promised salvation of their souls. Peter is writing to a community that has already passed the giddy experiences of its initial formation, but it is still so remarkable 
as it lives out its faith, that converts are drawn to it constantly. Long after the joy of their mountaintop experiences in Christ, the gentle humor, the love, the certainty, and the courage of their lives were unmistakable evidence that convicted them of being followers of the way, and it drew people to them. Whatever secret thing they had, others wanted too. This would essentially be so for each one of the Christian communities in those days. This ought to characterize our faith, too. That's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. In the reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31, we have the well-known sequence from which we get the term Doubting Thomas. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas called Didymus the twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written here in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. After the resurrection, the early appearances of the Messiah had to have been mind-boggling. At the same time as he commissioned their ministry and gave them authority to forgive sins, he was still teaching them about faith. When Thomas missed the Master's first appearance, his response might have been a little over the top, but he wasn't buying their stories. He was kind of like somebody from Missouri, I think, maybe. Thomas was there when our Lord showed up again, however. <clears throat> Jesus' words in verse 27 address the unbelief of his disciple, but they go much further. They show in no uncertain terms that he was also there when Thomas accused the others of blowing smoke, as it were. We should notice here the immediate response of Thomas was complete and unconditional belief. My Lord and my God. He didn't need to touch the wounds of the Master any more than the others had. If he'd known Jesus was listening, he wouldn't have said what he did earlier, I don't think. When Jesus continued speaking to Thomas, he was also speaking to the rest of us. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. It is another beatitude, but one that is special for all of us who haven't seen the Master in the flesh. It is a blessing given to us at baptism and released with great power when we confess our faith and, knowledge and acknowledge our Abba, when we open our hearts to Jesus Christ. It happens when we give in to the wispy silken threads of the Holy Spirit. It happens when we give in to the yearning of our hearts and let it pull us into the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus extended a commission in verse 23 to his disciples that over the century since has focused on priests and bishops in the church and their execution of the sacrament of penance, which is important in its own right, but it isn't quite so simple, I think. 
I propose instead the commission extends in one way or another to every one of us in how we practice our faith. We each have issues with right and wrong, and perhaps especially with proper justice when we see others do harm. But our Abba tells us he will take care of vengeance, and he will repay the sinner. Deuteronomy 32.35, and cited by Paul in Romans 12.19. If it's good enough for the Apostle Paul, it should be something we take seriously, don't you know? This doesn't mean ignoring, justifying, or affirming the sins we see in others, or in ourselves for that matter. Excuse me? We're not called to be codependents or enablers. We're not called to rationalize. We're not called to rationalize our own faults. We're not called to be politically correct. We're called to pray always, to be truthful but kind, and to love and help those around us as we love and help ourselves, as we love God. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us is sometimes a punch in the gut. Our brothers and sisters need our help not our condemnation. And in the end, only this is what we are called to do. His mercy endures forever, as it says in Psalm 118. How long does ours last? Finally, let's be clear here about how much verse 29 speaks to all of us, reiterating and finishing off in the words of the Messiah what glows in the verses from Acts what shines in Psalm 118, and what Peter wrote to the followers of the way in his epistle. We who have not seen the Lord in any physical way, nevertheless at some point see with our hearts. For most of us, the yearning for him our Abba has put there becomes after decades of struggle irresistible. Even when we claim him as our Lord and Savior, Jesus knows we haven't truly given over to him all the various nooks and crannies of our lives. Most of us cease fighting with him only in the years when we have grown old, and many of us not even then. We don't know how to do this right, and at the same time we don't remember to ask our master for help or to rely on him. Only with God is this possible. All we can do is open the door to our hearts, knowing full well letting the camel's nose into the tent is only the beginning. It takes courage, a lot of humility, and a lot of humor to get this right, to do it right. And these come to us only through the grace of our Abba, the love and power of our Messiah, and the comfort and guidance of the Holy Spirit. A line from the prayer of St. Francis is appropriate here. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. When our egos slow down and our reliance on God speeds up, the reality of our faith blossoms, and with the grace of the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we truly find ourselves more certain as followers of the way and faithful children of our Abba. It is only in this condition that we open ourselves to the divine mercy, which, which we remember especially this Sunday, a mercy that seeks always and everywhere to embrace us, to protect us, and to fulfill us. God bless you and keep you safe.